Welcome to the Source of Commercial Real Estate, where we discuss all things non-residential commercial real estate, including finding and funding deals, market intel, finding a competitive advantage, and using real estate to live the life that you want. I am your host, Jonathan Hayek, and today I am talking with Dave Cheatham. Dave is an accomplished authority on retail real estate in the disciplines of brokerage, project leasing, development, consulting, and advisory services. He's a senior advisor to merchants, entrepreneurs, investors, and senior retail executives throughout the industry. He's helped shape the corporate real estate policy for many of the nation's top retail brands. His extensive client list includes leading companies like JCPenney, Hobby Lobby, Aldi, The Gap, Darden, Signet, and CVS Pharmacy. Additionally, he is known to excel in executing multi-store rollouts for retailers who are making an initial market entrance. With more than three decades of experience, his sphere of work has entered multiple growth cycles and several severe declines. Dave has transacted more than $3 billion of retail transactions and has been the mainstay for leading negotiation techniques that support the strategy for a retailer store distribution. Dave, thank you so much for joining me today. How are you? Yeah, I'm good. Thanks for having me. We're just in uh, sunny and hot Phoenix, Arizona. Yeah, it's only like 3 billion degrees there today or so. Yeah, yeah. actually, we've had kind of a rough last... It's actually kind of finally cooling down, but we did have... A really aggressive uh, early August, let's say. <laughs> glad, glad it's cooling down. Maybe you're back down into the double digits. Uh, but Dave, why don't we start out with you telling uh, me and the audience about your background, how you got started in real estate, and what your work looks like today? Yeah, for me, I was uh, in college. I was trying to figure out. I I came out of college like right during the early '80s in a recession, and so. Uh, I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do with my life. And I had a mentor in my life um, that kind of coached me into getting into commercial real estate. Didn't know that much about it. And he's like, trust me, I know you. This is be something you're good at. Uh, and then I started, you know, really kind of digging in uh, to that process. Got hired in those days. It was called Coldwell Banker. And they've gone through so many iterations today at CBRE. But I worked there for 22 years and I was mentored by two really talented you know, men, which was a big, which was a big deal that gave me a really good start um, so that I could kind of have a foundation to build, you know, the brokerage practice. And that's, that's kind of really where I started. Cool. And Dave, uh, what do you find yourself focusing most on today? You know, it's interesting because uh, when you said I've been doing this for three decades, I get scared when I hear that, but actually <laughs> in another year, it'll be four decades. So I came out of school and got hired at 23 and I've been doing it for, uh, almost 40 years and and it's changed over that time our our my favorite thing to work on really if i boil it down there's lots of things i enjoy in this in this business but i loved working i love working with rollout tenants where you do the stat, strategy just you know the distribution of their stores and you bring somebody new to the market and do 30 40 50 stores and you know over you know several years cool so um, I'm going to start out this conversation with maybe a question you haven't gotten much recently. Um, uh, commercial real estate is in the midst of kind of a difficult time. Um, so in what areas are you personally or Velocity Real Estate? Um, where are you seeing, seeing tailwinds and success right now? Well, one of the advantages that we have, you know, is, is we've gone, you know, obviously real estate's a, you know, cyclical business. Um, if you take the eighties, the nineties, we had the cycles in the eighties that were difficult nineties were, you know, a little more smooth sailing. And then, you know, we had some drama at the beginning of the millennium. And so we've kind of up and down. And of course, when we got to 2008, nine, 10, it was devastating. I mean, everything kind of came through a stop. So when people talk about, Hey, is there going to be a recession? You know, to us recessions, you know, could be kind of a road bump. It could, you know, a bump in the road, uh, and it's not, it doesn't have to be that big of a deal. A lot of times it creates opportunity, but as long as it's not like the devastation of 2008, 2009, 2010, when everything came to a standstill. And right now today, there's tremendous interest in retailers. We've had such strong retail sales. There's tremendous interest in, in retailers expanding. The biggest challenge, you know, to that has been these cons it's almost our own success because as the economy got so overheated, 
And then, you know, we went through COVID and there was a little bit of an adjustment, but still people went crazy buying. And there was a lot of people that were like, hey, we're not traveling. You know, we're not able to do some of these things. So they were spending money on retail and it was retail therapy during that time. So that that gave, you know, a lot of these retailers more impetus to expand their stores. So we see a lot of expansion. The challenge is we're getting these costs that are higher. And those are the ones that are creating not not a tailwind, but a headwind for that expansion. So you talked about one of the things that you enjoy spending most of your time on is assisting tenants, uh, you know, some retail clients with expanding or maybe entering a new market for the first time and developing a strategy. So let's talk about that a little bit. Tell me about um, maybe a recent experience that you had, a recent success or, um, you know, kind of your overall strategy when a new player enters a market and they come to you for some suggestions. How are we going to do this? We want to roll out 30, 40, 50 stores. What advice are you giving these retailers? Well, the first thing is there's kind of two different approaches. If a lot of times you'll get like a young gazelle company that's doesn't, maybe they came out of one state, they're doing really well. And they've got some private capital that says, Hey, we're going to give you five or 10 million to kind of take it to the next level. That kind of a retailer you have a different approach for because the first few stores absolutely have to knock it out of the park. In the old days, we had, um, you know, Mimi's Cafe came out of came out of California in the 90s, and we worked with them. Uh, Rubio's came out of California in the 90s, and we worked with them. And, and those are the ones that, like, if they don't get a firm foundation, they won't get more capital to be able to kind of more venture capital to be able to take it to the next level. Mostly what we do is, like, these companies that might be regional or, they want to be national, so they start moving across the country. So, you know, in the 2000s, we had uh, CVS that came out and said, hey, we want to, you know, the, the new movement for grocery at the time was to come out of the anchored shopping centers and go on the immediate corner and be, you know, right on the corner. And in that case, we did about 80 stores. And so in that case, they're sitting there saying, hey, we're, this is what our store is. We think that, you know, over the next five years, let's say that we can do this volume of stores. And then it's it's really putting a plan together that evenly distributes so you don't end up taking market share, you know, from another store. If you put them too close, you can't move the stores, you know, in those shorter terms. So that's, that's uh, the one approach that we have. So that's our favorite approach. So if you come in and Waterburger would lay dormant in this market for years and years and years, and then they came in and they had new private capital and they go, we want to blow the market wide open. And so let's say we've done 40 stores with them and they just came in and started infilling, you know, in a new market. So that's kind of a third approach that we do. Somebody that's already been here, but now they want to explode for, you know, either because of capital, new concept, new prototype, et cetera. Tell me about the top factors or considerations that you think about when um, when helping a business like this expand. Is it simply location, uh, you know, being on a main and main intersection, or what sorts of things are you walking them through that the retailer needs to think about to have the most success to expand? Well, each each retailer is a little bit different, so there's a different cyclographic you know, client that likes their, you know, that is successful and gives them a, you know, a better high volume store. So we, one of the things that's really important is to get the market knowledge from the, not the market knowledge, but the customer um, knowledge, like who's our customer. And so when we really understand the customer and the better they understand the customer, then the better we can be able to go and find, Hey, this is where we need to be. And this is where we need not to be. Um, so there's certain parts of, of Phoenix, for example, that if we were doing a rollout in Phoenix, we'd say, you know what, this concept is really a middle America concept. So if we went to a real high income area, maybe it's got, you know, um, not a lot of kids, you know, it's got an older, you know, an older customer. Maybe it's, you know, like if you get to North Scottsdale, you don't have the density. You, you, a lot of these people are op- older, empty nesters. So you don't have the families. Maybe a lot of them are re- um, are um summer homes or win- winter homes or whatever i should say winter homes you know more winter homes or snowbirds or whatever so you don't have the density you know people being here for 365 days so we look at areas to avoid and we look at areas to go so first we start wide with the customer then we start with the trade areas and then we're like hey these are the great trade areas that'll fit that that customer and then from 
from trade areas, we narrow it down to intersections. And then it goes, then you parse down the intersection all the way down to what's the corner, where's the space on the corner, what's the visibility access. You know, is it a space, you know, there's a space that we call like a Statue of Liberty that everybody can see it, but you can't get to it. You know, <laughs> oh, I got to go down here, do a U-turn, cut across the deal. So access, visibility, all those things, you know, factor into it. Signage, um, you know, can I get my colors? Can I get my trademark? You know, there's some cities that will, you know, block you on trademarking. So, you know, you can't be seen and they can't they can't carry out. If you're Home Depot, you want the Home Depot orange. If you're, you know, if you're McDonald's, you you know, McDonald's for years and years had a building that with a roof line that all looked the same. So all of these factors kind of fit into it. And I'm thinking about, you know, you mentioned Whataburger. And, you know, in that example, I think I think you were giving the example of they were already established in the market, but they wanted to expand and maybe compete with some other QSR concepts. Would that be an example where you want to want to be really careful about, um, you know, sort of the 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 micro location? Because it, correct me if I'm wrong, what a burger has kind of a it's a qsr but it has more of a diner feel and so i would think that would be an example of what you were talking about with wanting uh to be in an area with kids and families with kids and so when you get into a north scottsdale location or cave creek where houses are a little more spread out uh maybe there's more empty nesters up there um that would maybe not be a great idea for that kind of concept am i am i onto it there yeah, I mean, first of all, Waterburgers, you know, competes with the Jack in the Boxes, the McDonald's, you know, and whatever from that standpoint. They've got a double mm-hmm. drive through, you know, mm-hmm. so, you know, it's it's Joe Lunchbox, it's the families, it's it's the working guy or whatever from that standpoint. It's fast food. Um, and so when we do like in their case, when they came in the market, a lot of these stores had, you know, 30 years of old stores, different prototypes, smaller, you know, whatever. The double drive through is kind of a newer deal, how to push more people faster, you know, through the through the, uh, to get the product to the customer quicker, you know? So in some of these cases, yes, we look at areas and we go, nope, we're not going to go there. That's not a match for us. You know, um, we've got to be where, you know, it, it, it best fits our customer. The other thing that we have to factor in is what does our competition look like? Sometimes there's, you know, there was a guy in the eighties that was a president or CEO of Pepsi. And he said, you know, when he was talking about food, he said, there's, there's, there's a stomach share. There's only so much food that people are going to eat. And, and if you get in certain markets like in Texas or whatever, they have so many choices. You know, we've got a market up in the Northwest. It's a fantastic market. It's always been a top producing market up by Arrowhead. But there are so many restaurant concepts up there that some at some point the law of diminishing return kicks in. You're like, yeah, I don't even get a shot at it because there's so many options. You know, they got 50 different restaurants to choose from where you might go into some markets and you open a new store, let's say in Albuquerque, and you open the store and they're like, holy cow, we got a Whataburger and everybody's going out there on their, you know, anniversary as a date, you know, so it's, it just depends (laughs) on the trade area. Um, Are a lot of your clients, are they looking at ground up development? Yeah. I mean, uh, it, it, if you talk about, so there's different categories of clients. So like if, if you were doing something, you said, Hey, I'm a big box guy. You might go and say, I'm going to go take a second generation space, or you might say there's nothing in the area. So I'm just going to take down 20 acres and build my box. If you're a pad user, most of the time it's ground up, you know? So if you're a McDonald's, if you're, if you're, you know, any of those kind of users that uh, Starbucks or whatever now like to be freestanding with the drive through whatnot. So most of those, those tenants are, are, our first generation, you know, ground up, you know, type product. I'm thinking about uh, an investor that's listening and they've got a strip mall with a pad or an out parcel and it's a great location. And they're thinking, gosh, I'd love to have a Whataburger or a Starbucks or an in and out um, something, uh, you know, something like that in this location. How does an investor get in touch with you or uh, the tenant, uh, one of these great tenants that would be great, you know, add tons of value for the investor and also be a great spot for, uh, for this concept. Um, what advice do you have for a tenant who wants to attract, for an investor who wants to attract a great tenant like this? Yeah, I mean, the first thing I would do, depending on what market I was in, is I would, I would do my homework and find out who the two or three people are that are best a class on the 
retail commercial brokerage. When I go into any market, it's not really hard to find out who the major players are. So first of all, I would hire a major player. Um, and I'm not talking about size of the company. I'm talking about um, aggressive, talented broker that's a top producer, you know, scenario um, that knows what they're doing. And then I would have them, you know, do a void study for me and say, hey, these are all the people that are not in the trade area. And then from there, after you know who's not in the trade area, then you can sit there and say, you know, here, here's my list of tenants. Who's a match for me? And then you basically just do, you know, subtraction and say, hey, these guys aren't here. So um, let's take the list of the ones that are there, take them out. And now what's left over is, is the candidates that could possibly work for the space. You would go through and eliminate anyone that's too big, you know, or, or doesn't fit on the site because you might get a Portillo's or one of these concepts that's really big. Maybe they need 60,000 feet or, you know, and you only have an acre, you know, depending on what your size is. And then it's really letting that broker go make contact with them with the marketing materials and see if they can gain entrance, gain interest. Yeah. Um, tell me more about the void study. That is, uh, that's the first time that I've heard that phrase. Is that a, um, is that a third party that does that? Does a great leasing broker do that void study? Because it, it makes tons of sense. Yeah. I mean, um, it, the answer is yes to both of them. So like what we do is we use certain technology. So let's say we use a deal called site where site, site USA, and they pull up, they have, you know, everything is geocoded and they know where all the tenants are. And you may run a, you know, a, a um, example and say, I want to run everyone in a three mile radius that's here. And I want to run everyone in the database that fits this criteria that's not here. And so when you do the math, and you, and you roll through and you go, okay, these guys, let's eliminate who's here. And we always start with, there's sometimes you can bring somebody from down the street and relocate them, but that's the lowest percentage. So we always start from, hey, if there's no Chick-fil-A here and, and there's not a Chick-fil-A for seven miles, and this is great real estate with great retailers around it, let's call Chick-fil-A, you know? And it's like, you go through that list of people first. Um, so the reason I say yes, is we use, you know, somebody, we, we use a third party's technology to kind of run the deal. And then it's just old school prospecting, you know, pick up the phone and dial someone and go, Hey, is this a fit? I notice you're not, you're seven miles away. We've got, you need 60,000 square feet. We have 60,000 square feet. Here's the price. And you like these kind of co-tenants. we got a target across the street, whatever the story is, and then see if there's a fit. I'm thinking about a tenant like Starbucks, tons of investors would love to have a Starbucks, uh, you know, build on a, on a pad, that they have. Uh, and there was a time when, you know, there was a joke, you know, Starbucks was, you know, building on, you could find a Starbucks on every single block. I think they're backing off of that a little bit now. Is there, I don't know, how do you get the information when you say, okay, hey, uh, Chick-fil-A is seven miles away, or, um, you know, an in and out burger isn't even in this market, and, and, and they might want to come in. How do you know, you know, what sort of radius different uh different concepts or retailers are interested in or is it just a matter of hey you don't know just get on the phone and start calling people no you you know it's it's interesting so in the old days there was a model that said you know we do a regional mall like every 12 miles mm -hmm. and then we do maybe like a, a um power center every seven miles and we do let's say a grocery store every three to five miles and then when you look at different tenants, you start looking at them and you go, wow, I mean, a McDonald's can be every two miles if you look at how close they get for fast food. So you start putting people mentally into categories. So if there's a target, you know, in your neighborhood on one corner, you're not going to go two miles down the road and see another target. You're going to see kind of that distribution. One of the things that we've learned in America with kind of the with the, you know, the, the battle against the the. Um, regional malls as they start declining and whatnot is really, we don't need all those regional malls. We also learned that when we rolled through the nineties and everything, every retailer got bigger and bigger and bigger, and they started out 15,000 feet, then 20, then 30, then 40, then 50. And then now everybody's backing down those spaces. Well, you don't, we, we knew that we didn't need to have a Barnes and Noble every five miles in the city. So you started seeing them close. We didn't need a Barnes and Noble to be their prototype of 40,000 square feet. The first 
concepts of Barnes and Noble was like Bookstar and it was 12,000 square feet. Well, then Barnes and Noble became like 40,000 feet. Well, you don't need 40,000 feet. So if you look at a Barnes and Noble today, maybe it's 15,000 feet and maybe it's, you know, I don't know what their new distribution is, but maybe it's 10 miles. So you're like, oh, I want to go to a bookstore. Well, you're going to drive an extra 10 minutes. You don't need one right around the corner, you know, so it, it's everything kind of fits into a category. If you're a sit down restaurant, you go, oh, I want to go to an Olive Garden. You don't have an Olive Garden on every corner like you do fast food or like you do Starbucks. So Starbucks, Starbucks is looking like, where's my customer? Where's which is you? They could be across the street from each other because you got traffic going in two different directions and maybe there's median bound or whatever. And you're like, wow, these people are going to work this way and these people are going to work that way. So um, it just depends on the retailer. You touched on uh, a couple different trends that you've been seeing in the retail space, be it uh, Barnes and Noble or Starbucks or, um, you know, all kinds of different changes that we're seeing. What other changes in patterns are you seeing in the retail space, whether it's QSR or, or whether it's, you know, a different kind of uh, subclass of, of retail? Well, if you, you know, when you pick, if you picked up a newspaper or read something on the internet or whatever, for the last few years, there's been this false narrative out there that has been so pronounced that I had people saying like, gosh, is your business going to be defunct because you can't <laughs> retail's dead. Everybody's ordering everything off of Amazon. And that was really a message for like 15 years. It was all oh, the battle between bricks versus clicks. And what we learned is that was a completely false narrative. And the reality of it is if you're, if you were a, uh, basically bricks and mortar, you have to have almost all retailers have to have an online solution. And if you take what, you know, when everyone's like, oh, they're just going to get on, you know, Amazon. Well, first of all, the number one, you know, thing that Americans want to do is go shopping. You go on vacation. What does everybody want to do? They want to go shopping. So there's more people that visit the Mall of America than, than visit each year than visit Disney World. So when you sit there and you look at number one is people like shopping. Number two, people like value. So one of the things that you saw with Amazon is that Amazon in the last few years has been the largest occupier of real estate in the country. They're the ones that were buying up all the steel, opening up, you know, logistics centers, opening up. They're trying new retail concepts because they're like, we have to. What do you think is more efficient getting in the car and driving? If you're Walmart, if you're trying to sell batteries, is it more efficient to have an 18 wheeler bring a truckload of batteries and you go to the store and buy those two batteries that you need? You know, you need four AA batteries or whatever, or is it for you to get on the computer and and Walmart to ship you four batteries? I, I had somebody do it just for fun the other day and the lady the woman delivered it to me and she said, I go, I ran out the door and I caught her and I go, hey, let me ask you a question. How much did you get paid to deliver these batteries? She said, well, they're six dollars. Well, my batteries cost about five dollars. So not only did she I mean, they totally lost money on the transaction. We were at a conference right during COVID and some of the Amazon speakers are there and they were saying in New York City, every time they deliver groceries, they lose $14. And then they try to change, you know, the price and then nobody delivers groceries. The real answer is you have to do both. And, and there's, you know, if you get a millennial that says, oh, I'm going to go, you know, we're going to Hawaii for the, you know, for our honeymoon. And she gets on there and orders 15 bathing suits and then she's going to keep two and she's going to send all the rest back for free. They're getting crushed. You know, it's, it's so... You've got to be able if you're if you're a store, you've got to be able to have a solution where they can deliver to your door like an Amazon. And you got to have a solution where you have a great shopping experience. You may have an experience. You may have to have a deal where you can do pickup, which we learned during covid. And depending on who you are, you may need a drive through. And I, the example I always use on a really good, you know, matter of fact, I, I, I had a business meeting there earlier today when I was showing space, if you take Panera, Panera used to be, you would go to Panera and you would buy a sandwich. And that was your retail experience, bricks and mortar. Then they said, oh, you know what? We're going to copy someone like Jimmy John's and we're going to deliver. Well, now that's like an Amazon. Okay. So there's four channels and they're like, well, one is you come in and you go, do I like the inside of the store? Is it, is it decorated properly? Is it comfortable? Okay. I'm going to Panera to have lunch. So somebody wants to meet their girlfriend there and have lunch. Somebody else is like, I'm in a hurry. I'm going to, I'm, I, I just want it. I'm working through lunch. I want it delivered. Somebody else says, I'm in a hurry. I'm going to drive through the drive-through. Somebody else says, and what's even faster than going through the drive-through, I'm going to get online and do it digitally, run in the store and it'll be ready in 10 minutes and pick it right out of the, off the shelf 
and get in my car like you've probably done with with uh, Starbucks if you do mobile ordering. So you have to be able to play on all four of these. Well, the market and the press and media were saying, oh, my gosh, it's dying. It's dying. Everyone has to be like Amazon. Well, Amazon has to be like everyone else and everyone else has to be like Amazon. And you really need to touch on at least three of these channels and in, in most cases, four. It, it is so interesting to me because it's like on the one hand, retail is so simple, but then on the other hand, it's so complicated because, you know, you gave some great examples there of the Amazon effect. And right now we're seeing Amazon have some serious issues, it, particularly in the grocery space. Um, they're learning that uh, being a grocer is not very easy. And you gave the great example of uh, Amazon losing money on grocery delivery. Um, they've been testing out some concepts of like Amazon Fresh, and those are some of those are really struggling. And um, then you have a concept like um, a store like Bed Bath and Beyond, which was just so slow to uh, to pivot to the online game. And they're, as we know, they're now out of business uh, because they were just banking on people continuing to come into the store and it didn't happen because sheets and towels, people just decided they were gonna buy that stuff online. But then on the other hand, we have a retailer like TJ Maxx or Ross, which uh, relies on people coming into their store and those stores are doing really well. And a lot of those discount stores are doing really well and they, I think they have an online presence, but I imagine it's such a small percentage yeah, of their yeah. sales. Um, and so some of those discount stores are doing so well. And so me as an investor, I'm like, man, what if I, what if I guess wrong? And, um, you know, whatever, you know, whatever tenant I sign, you know, uh, doesn't have the right, doesn't have the right strategy. Do you have any thoughts on, on, on what I just spewed out at you? Yeah, absolutely. Like if you take like, let's say five years ago, Everyone was like, oh, my gosh, we hate big box. Now, remember, all these big boxes, when they started creating the category killer, that was in the 90s. So it's like, oh, gosh, oh, uh, let's see. There's a stationary store. Let's make it giant. We'll call it an Office Depot. <laughs> yeah. We'll call it an Office Max. We'll call it Staples. Well, whatever. So the first round that we did is we started building these concepts, which was great. And then we built them in twos and threes and fours where you don't need that many competitors. And then we didn't have an online solution. And then we kept making them bigger and bigger and bigger and closer and closer and closer. And then all of a sudden online starts really catching on and it starts getting better. And they go, wow, let's say I am Office Max. Wouldn't it be great if I could just deliver to the office people and they could call up on the, on the and just have them drop those big old boxes of paper and toner and whatever? Yeah, you should be able to do that. Well, what if somebody wants to come into the store and search around and look at like look at a product and look at printers? Great, come in the store and you know get a good shopping experience, you know. And then, well, what if there was COVID and whatever? You don't need a drive-through for 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 an office store, you know, for Staples or Office Max. So you might sit there and go, well, I can deliver three of these. Maybe I order online and I don't want to pay for shipping, so I can just come by and pick it up because one of the the other shoes dropping on shipping. They're seeing things now going back to. No free shipping. You got to spend fifty dollars. Why? Because they're getting their butts kicked. It's like they're losing money. They're bleeding out that money. And I love these. You know, like even in, in my company, I'll see these young women, and they go, "I'm like, they're opening up their stuff from Amazon, and they got six pairs of shoes." And I'm like, "Are you keeping six pairs of shoes?" And they're like, "No, I'm just trying them on. I'm going to get one." So now they just put them all in a deal, drop them off at Kohl's, whatever the scenario is, put them back in the bag and spend all that money to send five pairs of shoes, they didn't make any money. They lost money. So it's it's finding the balance. Everybody's trying to find the balance. And so we learn now it's not a battle. It's efficiency. And it's it's the customer wants what the customer wants, the way the customer wants it, when the customer wants it. If they want it on their front door, they want it on their front door. The other thing that's really powerful is if you're using an online experience, the, the internet becomes your stock room. So what I mean by that is like, there's been times I've gone into companies like Athleta with my wife or daughters. And so they look at something, they go, oh my gosh, I like that, that top. And there's one in hot pink, there's one in black, there's one in white. And they're like, I want the hot pink one. And they go, well, we don't have that in your size. So you come over to a screen. In that case, you touch the screen 
and they drop ship it to your house tomorrow. Well, used to be, you know, you'd wait, well, we can, let me get on the phone here and see if the Scottsdale <laughs> store has your deal. And you can, yep, we got one out in Queen Creek, you know, and you can just get in the car and it's a 40 minute drive and yeah, they're going to hold it for you. Yep. They're <laughs> going to hold it for you. Now they just drop it to you and you have it tomorrow. So, so that's the premise, you know, in this game that, that they have to play. Yeah, that it's, we're in a time of transition. I think, you know, I, Total I'm a consumer. Transition. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I don't, I don't do a ton of shopping, but I do some shopping and, you know, I think of one retailer like REI, I, I do a lot of shopping at REI and they've transitioned recently to where, um, you know, if you buy stuff online, you have to pay for shipping back to them. So no more free returns at REI. And I right. think other retailers are doing the same thing because, um, you know, you touched on it earlier, someone's going on vacation and they need a new bathing suit and they buy 15 bathing suits. And over the last 10 years, we got into this habit where, you know, we could just buy whatever we want and they'd, in and sometimes include a return shipping label in this package. So whatever I can try on 15 different bathing suits, keep one, send 14 back. And me as the consumer, I don't have to think about it anymore. Uh, but now that's shifting because a lot of these retailers, they can't resell uh, what has already been sent out. You right. know, if you're, if you're sending out right. bathing suits or underwear or right. whatever, and people are trying stuff on, you can't, I can't send it back to REI and REI is not going to put that right back on the shelf. It goes to this other third party. And, um, so then REI is losing money on, on, um, on the stuff. And so it's just, it's a real, it seems like we're in a real time of transition right now of like finding this balance because retailers can't continue losing all this money on online, online shopping. Uh, but me as the consumer, I still want what I want. And so we've got to find this balance. That's, I mean, you've said it really well. It's like, the funny thing is, is while we've been going through transition, people are misinterpreting it as it's finding its equilibrium because each retailer has to find their equilibrium. For me, I look at a concept and I, and I chuckle at like, you know, at home improvement and I'm like, they're not even close to finding their equilibrium. So if you take like, if you took like a Home Depot and you said, if you went down to Home Depot and you said, I need to buy, I'm going to remodel my house and I need to buy five white ceiling fans. When you go in there, they're not going to have five white ceiling fans. I bet you they're going to have two and they're going to go, oh yeah, we don't have any, but you can drive to surprise and they've got one and whatever. Well, think about this for a minute. If they had an approach like Amazon, and you came into a market and you said, we're going to do two large distribution centers, you know, big fulfillment centers. And you're going to, you might go into Home Depot and you go, this is what I like. And so you've got the display and you go, that's the ceiling fan I want. You look up at the ceiling, you got 20 different choices. You're not trying to figure it out. And, you know, oh, that does look a little smaller. Oh, I don't like that blade length. You know, whatever. Oh, that, oh, that, that's not a bright white. It's an off white or, or it's, you know, what, what am I looking for? So, you want to be able to, you might go in there and say, just like I was telling you with Athleta, go over to the screen and say, please drop me five of those tomorrow. And the trucks are just running all over town, just like Amazon in your neighborhood and drop off your five ceiling fans. And so that's the focus. If you're, if you're a contractor, why in the world would you take your pickup truck? Why would you take blocks and bring in thousands of blocks with, with, uh, um, loaders and put them in the store and then somebody brings their truck and then take a loader and put it in their truck so they can drive it to the job site. You would just get online and say, I need 42 blocks or I need 152 blocks, 17 bags of sand. And the fulfillment center is just running your stuff to the job site. I mean, this is what it's all about. It doesn't matter if you're serving Jimmy John's or Panera or your Home Depot. You know, it's like, the game that we learned and the transition that we've seen from Amazon is people want some things brought to their door. And then the other things people want to touch. You mean like if you go and buy a pair of shoes, it's a hard thing to buy on the internet. Cause you're like, Oh, I tried these on. I tried these on. Now, if you say, I like Alan Edmund shoes, which I do. And I go, guess what? I can order those online because I know for 10 years I've wear size eight wide, whatever the stereo is. And then I see that, oh, that's that shoe. I know what it is. And I'm replacing it. Boom. I can order that. They drop ship it to my, if I want to go look at a new product, they're using the stock room. The internet is a stock room. They go, 
yeah, here's the shoe. I love it. We have it in a seven and a half. We have it in a nine. And I know I need an eight E. And they're like, yeah, we'll have it in your house tomorrow. I mean, that's the game. I heard uh, the story recently about Target and how, you know, five to seven years ago, years ago, Target was downsizing their stores. And now they're actually upsizing their stores because they're using a chunk of their storage area as um, like whatever you call it, like last mile delivery. Yeah, and so they're finding that actually instead of leasing out a separate warehouse, we can use our current store and then we can have you know, then we have warehouses in all the markets that we're in. Um, and so that's been kind of a, a transition for Target. Do you see any, um, you know, talk to an investor trying to make good decisions with investments right now. Do you see any patterns right now or sort of a trajectory of where retail is going, where um, a savvy investor can make good decisions right now and be opportunistic because, hey, this is where things are going in the next five years. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that was hard, if you go back five years and everyone's like, oh, we don't want power centers and we're scared because the death of the big box and all that, we're kind of past all that. So if you sat there and said, well, who's going to win? Are we going to have an office max? Are we going to have a staples? Are we going to have an office depot? Are we going to have a whatever? So when you started seeing things merge and things like that, we're past most of that drama. You know, like, I don't know if you're in your market, you're seeing 500 brands, you know, 15 different brands for car washes. So if I was an investor and I'm buying a car wash, I would be nervous because I go, you don't need 15 brands of car washes. You know, so are they going to start buying each other? Predictable. You know what I mean? Yes, they're going to buy them. So when you get into the deal where there's a lot of you know transition and turmoil right now, I'd stay away from it. But when you go look at a power center, if I go in there and I go, wow, okay, they got a Nordstrom Rack. Wow, that's the tenant for the future. And it's right size. You know, like there's a new project that I just came from. We were looking at it for Old Navy. And when I looked at the project, and I was looking at the names. It's all the people that you look at now and you believe in. If you say Ross, they go check. TJ Maxx, love it. Home TJ Home Goods, people love it. Sephora, love it. But then you see other things that, that are that are scarier that you wouldn't get into. Say Ulta, love it. So you look at these, you know, if we were talking about Sears and Kmarts and, you know, JC Penney's and some of the other people that were looking at them in transition, you know, Bed Bath and Beyond, nobody wants, you know, Office Maxes, Office Depots, things like that. They're scared of. Now you just stay away from the, the tenant mix that has the scary tenants in it. You know, if you're taking, you know, if you're going, wow. This is a new Kroger store, a new prototype, whatever. Or is this like some local neighborhood deal at 20, 30,000 foot, you know, store that's, you know, instead of 125,000 foot Kroger, it's a 30,000 foot neighborhood store, but it's 30,000, not because the prototype was 30,000, but because it's 50 years old. And that's, that's what it was 50 years ago. So it's, it's not as hard anymore in the last few years. Um, You're picking winners and, and you know, the winners. And you know intuitively the losers. Dave, there are some owners of retail centers who are pretty confident about the market right now. And when they see an expiring lease coming up in the next year or two, um, they see opportunity. So um, there's not a ton of retail being built, especially, you know, especially in these infill locations if um, there's just no room to build. And so uh, there are some Uh, property owners who are uh, saying, you know, I'm going to increase rents when this lease is up, I'm going to increase rents 20% or 30% because what's the retailer going to do about it? There's nowhere else to go. Let's say a retailer comes to you and says, Hey, Dave, my landlord's raising the rent 20 to 30% to this crazy amount. Um, You know, what do you think I should do? Is this, is this fair? Is this market? Or can you find me another space to go? How would you advise a retailer in that position right now? I mean, I have a couple of those things happening right now. And the reality of it is is like, Hey guys, remember 10 years ago when the market was in the tank and everybody's like, we're getting smoking deals. Well, the other shoe has dropped. The, the, the biggest things that's causing, in my opinion, the raising of rents, is they're seeing that new construction rents are so expensive. So it's justifying an, an increase in the bottom. So if you took, if you said, hey, I can't do this on, a, on the, I can't do it by showing you on the screen. But if you, if you take, um, 
let's say I'm trying to do a deal and it's a 15,000 foot tenant or 20,000 foot tenant. And the rents have gone from 18 bucks to 22 bucks because construction costs have gone up 30%. So now they're at 22 bucks and all the other spaces that were done five, seven, eight, ten 10 years ago were like 12 bucks. Well, now that you've got the 22 bucks, the guy that was paying 12, his lease comes up and they're like, wow, the new stuff's going for 22. I need 14. I need 15. That's what's driving those other rents. So there's not much you can do about that because I, the, we had a guy that was trying to make a deal with me and I go, I go, we can't afford it. And he goes, no, 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 we're going to give you a smoking deal. So he gave us a proposal and the proposal was kind of like a normal deal. And I go, you said you were giving us a smoking deal. I'm not going to get this done. You know, and, and it's a greener area and it doesn't have the density. So they're like, we just don't, and there's going to be cannibalization. So they're like, we're not comfortable paying like a normal new store. But if they came in and gave us a cheap deal, we might be able to justify it and grow it over time. Well, he gave me a normal price. I go, I thought you were giving me back. He goes, well, all the other prices have raised 30%. So the normal, that cheap deal is now this number. And I'm like, you're missing the point, bud. But it's, that's what's, what's driving those increased rents. The other thing is, when you don't, we've got the lowest vacancy probably in America than in, in the 40 years that I've seen. Phoenix is always a, a market that, you know, like I remember in 1989, our, our vacancies went to 18% in shopping centers, and that was a bad number. Office and industrial usually runs, you know, bigger vacancies than we do. Um, retail, they won't let you build unless you're 50% pre lease, generally speaking, whereas they let everyone else build, you know, tons of spec space. So right now, because there's been very little construction for 10 years, there hasn't been the ga- the the target in the market, the Lowe's, the Home Depot, the Walmarts. They've all sat on the sidelines figuring out how to do omnichannel. And so now all of a sudden, because there's not a bunch of shopping centers, all this, you know, a large percentage of that other space is getting leased. You know, in Phoenix, we just did our new numbers at the end of the 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 um, last um, cycle, the last quarter. And basically we're at the lowest vacancy I've seen in almost 40 years in the business. You know, we're like just we're barely below five percent, and and so these are the things that are you know that that are causing these effects in the market. Yeah. So that tenant that's faced with, uh, hey, you can pay, you know, you can go from eighteen to twenty-two bucks a foot, and the you know the landlord says, hey, it is what it is. That's what market is. If you want new, it's going to be thirty-two bucks a foot. So twenty-two sounds pretty good. Um, how how would you advise a retailer like that? Are you advising them, hey, you know what, get a great lease in a new location, pay a little more, or um, or Hey, stick with us 22 bucks a foot because that's if because when this re- retailer leaves, if you leave, someone else is going to fill it at 22 bucks a foot. Yeah, I mean, how would you advise my, someone? Yeah, my coaching would be if it's a great space is yeah, you're going to get a bump. When it was in the tank, you got a you you know, you got the decrease and yeah. you know, a lot of times people negotiated rent reductions, you know, when things were tough. Well, guess what? When things get more expensive, so what? It goes up a small percentage or whatever. I wouldn't just try to move and go to new space because it would generally speaking, I would only move and go to new space. if It was going to massively benefit the tenant, not, not, not to cut off my nose or spite my face or, or just sit there. Well, I guess we'll just go, you know, whatever, you know, you're just probably going to end up getting that 10, 15, 20% increase. Yeah. Great. Well, Dave, this has been an awesome conversation. I didn't really stick to my outline, so sorry about that if you were expecting yeah, no uh, me to stick to my outline. But this was just a really interesting conversation about um, sort of current trends in uh, in retail, according to Dave Cheatham. So um, I sincerely appreciate your generosity of time and expertise no, no today. If, um, if a listener wants to connect with you and, and talk with you or do business with you, where would you like to send people? Yeah, I mean, the best place to, to track us down would probably be on our website, you know, velocityretail.com. And my phone number is pretty simple. It's 602-682-6060. And uh, they're welcome to give me a call or whatever from that standpoint. And I'll put you with someone on my team that can help or I'll help you myself. Perfect. Dave, thank you so much. I sincerely appreciate you taking the time out to, to spend this time with me today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Have a great weekend. Awesome. Okay. Listeners, thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed this conversation, feel free to reach out to either one of us. We'd love to connect with you. Until next time, take care.